everyone. Welcome to the Revenue Lounge podcast. I'm Bhaswati and in today's episode, we will be talking about how to use customer data to drive revenue growth. As we all know, revenue leaders have been asked to drive efficient and effective revenue growth in the current economic environment. And to be able to reach this goal requires an uncontested access to all the customer data that companies have. First party customer data, if captured in a complete and accurate manner, and kept updated with automations can grant powerful insights to revenue teams to increase pipeline. Unfortunately, most organizations don't have access to clean, complete and updated customer data in core systems like CRM. They are drawing insights from data that is probably getting stale at rocket speed, is incorrectly entered or incomplete. As a result, they miss out on countless revenue opportunities. This is where the role of RevOps becomes crucial. They can not only identify these data gaps, but also install processes and tools in place that can help systems like CRM capture customer data in a complete and accurate manner. Let's learn more about the importance of customer data and how RevOps can play a role in leveraging powerful insights from it from today's guest. It's a pleasure to have Molly Bodensteiner with us today. Molly is the Global Revenue Operations Leader at Deal. She's a RevOps leader with a demonstrated history of leveraging data to produce efficient results. And she's passionate about utilizing technology to drive performance and innovation, among many other things. Hi, Molly. I'm so excited to welcome you to the lounge. Thank you so much for joining us today. Hi. Thanks for having me. I love that we're talking about this, right? Because I do think that the way we've historically talked about data as organizations has continued to evolve and will continue to evolve. And I'm, you know, very passionate that, you know, as an organization, regardless of if you're in RevOps, as, as a business, right, data is such a viable asset to your growth. And when leveraged properly, when managed properly, like it's a game changer. It's what sets what I consider, you know, successful companies versus mediocre companies apart. So really excited to share, you know, more about how that fits within RevOps and overall organizational structures. We can start by you telling us a little bit about your current role at Deal. Yeah, absolutely. So I've been with Deal just a little under a year now. And anyone who's familiar with Deal, Deal is a very, 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 very fast paced startup. You know, we talk about unicorns, probably even whatever the next thing is from from a unicorn have really achieved, you know, hyper growth over the last three years as an organization. And so I joined, you know, again, about a year ago. And really, my focus has been how do I improve process and systems under our revenue operations team. So when we think about sitting under revenue operations, we're all, you know, very familiar with, you know, the function of revenue operations. You've got your sales ops, your marketing ops, what I consider kind of your functional operations. You've got your tech and tooling. You've got your processes. You've got your data and analytics, right? And comes together kind of makes that full circle um, team. So while I'm a part of the revenue operations team, I spend the vast majority of my time really focused on our processes. And when we talk through processes, I talk about how do we drive the customer experience and the seller experience? To, and when we talk sellers, you know, anyone who's interacting with customers, helping to support the revenue process to be more efficient, more effective, and deliver better business results. And then the second part of that is how do I use the right data and the right technology to support those processes and turn those people? It's, it's a very detailed approach to revenue operations. Like you spoke about processes, you spoke about data, and you spoke about technology. So... Very excited to dive into probably each of that as we speak. Uh, So moving on to the next question is, this is something we ask all our guests on the podcast is, how do you define revenue operations? I love this question as, you know, I've commonly joked that like the tagline for revenue operations is it depends, right? So the way that I define revenue operations is very dependent on, you know, the detailed level of the organization that I'm working in, the maturity model. Instead, when I think about like, what is the goal of revenue operations, right? is how do you provide the right visibility across the revenue teams, right? Delivering the visibility across the revenue teams that improves efficiency across the entire revenue process. You're driving predictability and you're creating a more consistent experience. I could sit here and give like a fluffy, like this is what revenue operations is and what it isn't, but each business is going to have different needs, right? Um, If you're a 50 person company, your revenue operations function really might be centered around getting your backend infrastructure set up for CRM, right? And supporting the scaling there in the revenue process. As you continue to grow and you become a larger, more mature organization, you're going to have additional pillars 
of operations come into theirs. And I, I hate the word revenue and revenue operations for the sheer fact that it generally sways to sales operations. And we think about it in terms of, you know, comp, quota, commission, that stuff, right? Instead, I think it's really looking at the experience. And the more you can drive the experience from a customer standpoint and delighting, making things efficient, understanding, you know, how do I best service my customers and aligning the sales and the seller motion, right? And when I say seller, that's still marketing, that's still CS, that's sales, that's SDRs, that's anyone a part of the revenue organization who's ultimately accountable for that experience to delight the customers, to have the right information they need to make the best business decisions. Like that to me is what is revenue operations. It's the experience and making sure you have the best experience through the people, the process, the data and the technology. Love that. That's a brilliant way to look at revenue operations. Another fascinating thing about, you know, RevOps leaders that we speak to at Nectar is the journey that they undertook to get into the space. And usually we have some amazing answers. So would love to know your journey there too. Like how did you get into RevOps and, and what's your story? Yeah. So I would joke and I'd say I was in revenue operations before it was cool. Right. And before it's a thing. And I think I've, I've been fortunate enough with my career that when I think about why I'm so naturally gravitated and attracted to revenue operations, it's the efficiency, right? Natural problem solving, making things better, that improvement. And early in my career, I actually was building databases. So that was an internship I had out of college. It was taking, you know, a business problem and building an actual homegrown solution. And I'm like, not to age myself, like this was before CRM was cool and Salesforce was like the hot thing, right? And so having the opportunity to say, how do I fix a business problem with technology and improve a process with technology was something I was able to start doing, you know, before I had even graduated graduated college and then was fortunate enough to continue to grow within that organization, but also move to other organizations where I you know, was consistently in an operations function. Whether I was in marketing operations, partner operations, sales operations, um, it was always always in an operating type role um, and did, you know, a lot of consulting with other companies during my time with Marketo and other organizations, which, you know, I loved because it's, you know, what are people doing? Everyone is so different. So how do you take a problem and build the right solution for the business? There's no one size fits all solution to anything. And I think that's what's so appealing about revenue operations. My first official role in a revenue operations org, though, was only four or five years ago, right? And I'd say that was even still cutting edge for what we're doing on the industry. Since then, I've had the the opportunity to be a leader in four different companies leading revenue operations teams in some some way, shape or form. And it's been really fun. I think one of my favorite things about this is really like helping develop the talent in this, right? Um, you know, we always used to joke with marketing operations, right? They don't teach this in college, right? There's, you don't go to college and say, I'm going to be a Salesforce administrator, and that's what I'm going to do, right? So really being able to take and help shape career paths. And there's so much, this isn't a linear career path, right? I think I'm one of the few people who have started my career in this and kind of had this in my back pocket. But I love seeing like salespeople move into operations, marketers move into operations, finance people move into operations, right? Because it is just such a, it's an experience driven, problem solving, like value add function that like that diversity and that knowledge is so huge. Yeah, yeah, sounds like you were kind of destined to land up in operations. I joke because I'm like, oh, now there's like actually like a, a job title for what I feel like I had been doing at all these companies over the years, right? Like, oh, there's actually a name for what I'm doing. Yeah, finally, <laughs> long due. Thank you for sharing that. That's a very interesting uh, journey. So the next question is, is this something we are asking our guests in, in this season of the podcast is a lot has changed for revenue leaders in the last one year. The market has been unforgiving in a lot of ways and the uncertainty in the market has changed a lot of priorities for business leaders right so given all of that that is currently out there i just wanted to know in your opinion what is your biggest challenge today as a revops professional that you face yeah i mean so we've had a whirlwind the last 18 months or so right like we saw everything go sky high to you know starting to creep down. And so I think, you know, one of the big things that I think about here is, and, you know, the common trend, and I hate it, it's to do more with less, right? So as you think about the challenges that face revenue operations professionals today, it's, you know, how do you do more with less, right? And defining what less means and being smart about that in terms of the business trade off, right? So like, if you're having getting asked to cut costs, right? Where do you cut those costs and what those trade offs are, right? Are you automating through a tool? Are you getting rid of technology? Are you cutting headcount? Like what what does that mean to actually like do more with less and like be more efficient? Generally, you know, revenue operations teams in my mind typically don't have a lot of fat to them. Um, they're generally pretty lean, um, doing a lot, you know, 
very clear um, roles and responsibilities. Um, and when I say clear roles and responsibilities, it's probably better to say there's a lot on their plates um, that they're that they're doing at any any time. But it's you know how do you how do you operationalize that and how do you scale that? So we spend a lot of time as ops professionals looking at our stakeholders processes. Right? How do I make sales more efficient? How do I make sales more effective? How do I save time for sales? How do I improve productivity for sales or marketing or whatever team, like taking a step back and saying like, let's do that with our own or right. So like, how do you take, you know, that experience that you have and apply it to your own business unit, right? And say, how do I make revenue operations more efficient? How do I make us more effective? How do I streamline our intake process? How do I get better prioritization? Like those are the things that I look at as, you know, almost our own shortcomings being not reflective enough internally and building those improvements. That's how you're going to figure out how you can do more with less. I hate saying that, but like, it's how do you improve your own processes? Got it. So providing the customers a seamless experience throughout the customer journey is what will help businesses continue to evolve in, in such challenging times that we are in. So what's your perspective on that? You know, as of today, how crucial is customer data in driving this efficient and effective revenue growth and this whole do more with less mantra that everybody's about yeah so the best example i have on this is like put yourself in as your consumer right so um you know peloton i have a peloton love riding my peloton and you know if something breaks on it and i'm unhappy with that experience i have a support ticket open i need you know my pedal fix something like that like i'm gonna file a support ticket i'm gonna go through that experience like the last thing i want is like an email from peloton that's like buy more do this right like we've got to think about Think about the experience and that's where data drives that, right? And that's where, you know, as consumers, we expect um, the products that we use, the services that we use to have all this data because they do, right? And if they don't, something critical is missing, but they have this data. You can't tell me they don't. Whether they have it centralized, whether they have it unified and whether they have it actionable, completely different topic, but they have the data. I mean, it, it data is an output of process. If you're using the process, there is data, whether it's good data or bad data, hard to say. But as um, consumers, right, we expect that and we expect that experience. I expect that if I call into the pharmacy to get a prescription refill, they know what prescription I'm going to need refilled. They have that information. It sits there. That drives the experience, right? Could you imagine calling in a pharmacy and they're like, oh, we have no idea what you're talking about. Well, I've been a customer for 10 years and had this prescription for 10 years. Why is that different in SaaS, right? And why is that different in tech? And I think some of that goes down to like, we don't act, we have not successfully really built actionability off of our data against the experience and taking that step back and understanding, understanding the experience. And again, it's like, how do we produce more revenue? Well, we delight our customers. How do we delight our customers? We have the experience that they expect. How do we build the experience we expect? We align it with data. Um, you know, and I can chicken and egg this all day long, but it's how do you build that right experience and build those interactions and like manage the bad interactions too, right? And I think that's where a lot of customers go wrong is they don't use the data from the support team, from the CS, from those components to really produce next best action. It doesn't mean the next best action is revenue generating. It means the next best action meets the needs of the customer and anticipates their needs, um, pro solves the problem and keeps the owners all aligned. Got it. Yeah. So you said that the data is always there. It's just that the actionability and the plan around it is probably missing. Firstly, I would like to ask you, like, what's the cause of that? And secondly, what are the challenges that RevOps professionals face in accessing this data? Like what's preventing them from accessing clean and complete customer data in, let's say, systems like CRM? Yeah, right. Um, so I think a lot of the challenges with accessing the data is it's disparate. So when you think about all the different sources, you're probably storing customer data in. it requires that you actually have a strategy of this. Talk about like single source of truth of data. That's not in my mind, that's not as important, right? It's more having like a clear distributed source of truth of data and making sure you like you have the right data at the right time for the right need. I don't need us to have, you know, fully centralized, up to date, unified data at any given time. That's that's not possible, right? No business has that data is fluid, it's changing. It's more making sure that where your users are working and the data that they need to make decisions and build a customer interaction has that complete, accurate, um, necessary data. And, you know, for so long, everything was like BI, visualization, like let's build these great dashboards, right? Dashboards aren't actionable. Dashboards drive strategy, they buy, drive direction, they don't drive interaction. And so how do you take interacting data 
and actually surface that back up. So when I'm in CRM and I'm looking at, you know, customer ABC, I can see that they have a P1 ticket open with our support team. And, you know, the sentiment is red and like my next interaction shouldn't be, Hey, you want to buy more? It should be, Hey, how's everything going? I see you've got a ticket open, you know, as your account manager, I just want to make sure, you know, that I'm here to help support you. Like, I know I've been talking to the support team, but like, let me know what I can do to help. Like that type of interaction is how you build relationships, how you build trust, how you build credibility and compassion within your customers. And like, that's the information that you need to build that next action and do that. And that's where I think we focus on the aggregation and not as much of like the actionability when we think about using data. Got it. Yeah. So wrong kind of communication sounds like a common mistake that we've all faced as customers and we've probably all made as part of revenue operations team. So in your experience, apart from this, like what could be some of the common mistakes that RevOps teams make when when working with customer data and how can they avoid some of them? Yeah, I'm going to broaden this to not just be RevOps, right? I think that this is a mistake that a lot of just companies in general make is not having a data strategy, right? Having a clear data governance model, data definition. You know, when I get on a call with the CRO or CMO and I say customer, we should all be speaking that same language, right? Because if we're not and we don't have clear definitions aligned and defined, like we're going to make assumptions and making assumptions is going to sway, sway results, sway outcomes, sway decisions. So having a really clear like data dictionary, key definitions, um, foundational level metrics to find that you're building off of and slicing and dicing through is, is critical for this, right? And then also whenever I work on building any sort of report or looking at any metric, I ask like, what's the business decision you're going to make off of this, right? So if I give you this field, what are you going to do with it, right? How does this impact the customer journey? How are you going to use that? And really probing on that with stakeholders versus, you know, RevOps. I, I'm going to knock on us a bit, guys. So don't don't come at me on social media or things. But like, we're generally order takers, right? And a lot of that's because we're so underwater. We're getting hit with so many requests, and somebody's like, just build a field, and we just build the field. But again. How does that fit into the process? How does this drive value to the customer? Like, what does this do is going to change the perspective of like, do I build a field or am I building an actual like workflow that's managing an experience that's driving the business forward? And like, those are the conversations like we've got to start having as we think, you know, more strategically around the experience and more holistically around this. So I think like mistakes that we make are, you know, we, we don't have a good data strategy, right? Data authority, data management, even simple things like data normalization. And thinking about if I capture a pick list value in Zendesk that doesn't align to a pick list value in Salesforce, and I want to merge that data together, what does that mean? That's a pain, right? Like, and that's just foundational, like very simple things that can slow the momentum, skew the results and, you know, impact the business. But having that alignment, no one owns data, right? Everyone ha- owns pieces of data and parts of data in an organization, but getting that general group together of like, all right, what's our data strategy? What's our normalization guidelines? How are, are we going to standardize? How do we define? And then how do we build action off of this? I think is so critical. Um, and a part that like, generally, I don't think we do a very good job of in RevOps. And I think that's a really big opportunity for us to start supporting. Yeah, yeah. Whatever you mentioned, this is in alignment with a lot of RevOps leaders that we've spoken to in the past. Now that we've spoken about the data governance strategy, we have to come towards the tech stack to enable all of this, right? What kind of tools and technologies can RevOps use to access and maintain like clean customer data? Yeah, absolutely. So when we think about, you know, the people, the process, the data and the technology, you know, it's important to remember that like data is an output of process. So whatever your process is that you're building is producing data. And then technology is the support function that helps to streamline the process and gather the data um, and support the data needs. So it's really important that like when you're thinking about the technology you need, you have the clear process to find, you know, the data that you need to capture and how you need to manage it. And then the technology is subsidizing that versus your process is working for technology. And I see that happen a lot, right? We buy technology and we work for technology versus we have the process and we find the tool to support the process. So I think there's no right or wrong answer when it comes to your tech stack because it's dependent on your business, right? But making sure you have a way to capture that information. And you might be a two-person company and you might need to use a Google Sheet. And that's okay if the Google Sheet becomes your CRM, as long as you have structure and you have standard and you have governance and you have a process, like that's okay Um, until you scale and need something more. It goes back to the process and the data that you need from that and making sure you're capturing that. Now, the issue is, is you're a two person company and you have two salespeople working in two different spreadsheets, capturing 12 different pieces of information each where you start to have the problems. 
Um, so thinking about, you know, your, your capture strategy and what's the information you need, what decisions that's going to drive, how you're going to use it. And then also where does it need to go? Right. Cause not every, so I think a lot about product data, right? Product data intuitively is not sourced out of CRM. It should be coming into CRM if we're going to use it to make decisions or drive pieces, but I don't need every single attribute from my product into Salesforce, right? Salesforce is not a data warehouse. Salesforce is not data storage, right? Salesforce is an enablement of the experience. So how do you make sure like you bring that right, the right data in at the right time to deliver, deliver the experience. And so when I think about generally like what you need in a tech stack, you, you likely are going to need some sort of CRM, right? Some way place that you're going to action and manage the customer experience. Um, you're then also looking at like, where do, am I going to store all my data? Right? Like, so what becomes kind of my, my library of data, whether that's, you know, using a big query data warehouse data, like, you know, putting something in place so that you have that repository of data that you need. That's a little bit raw to use, but you know, where you're at least capturing so that you can determine kind of distribution and centralization. And then you're likely going to need something to help move data. That's the data engineering component of how do I get it from point A to point B, whether that's native integrations, whether that's using a middleware connector, but something that's helping you push data where it needs to go when you need it in the right way. So those are like when I think about the data tech stack, like that's generally kind of the three components that you need. But without having a strategy and without having governance and without having definition, it's not going to be good. So make sure you have those things first got it so create the governance strategy first and then go out and purchase the tools that you might need for your business is that right yeah so get the get the strategy right get the process defined understand the data you need um, and then build the infrastructure to support it thank you so much for sharing that since we are talking about the data governance strategy and you also mentioned that data should be looked at and understood the same way by all uh, revenue generating teams, which means that everybody should be aligned towards similar revenue goals. So just wanted to understand from your perspective, how do you create that kind of collaborative environment and a culture driven by, let's say, robust communication to ensure that revenue teams are on the same page when it comes to data? Yeah, absolutely. So when you think about this, right, it's it, it, you said the word, it's alignment, right? And, and alignment is hard because it takes work, right? And I think, um, you know, because of lack of like authority and ownership of a data strategy in most organizations, you're at the mercy of building alignment. And it needs to start at the top, right? It's something that's got to come down from the top of, you know, here's how we run our business. Here's how we measure our business. Here's how we use data as an organization. And this, this is what this means to each of these functions, right? We've come a long ways from, you know, marketing just having MQL goals and sales having revenue goals, right? We're, we're starting to look across the experience. We're looking at, you know, key metrics like net dollar retention and expansion, and we're getting past just, just the net new logo piece, right? Product led growth, lots of different things coming into the market as trends. And it's, you've got to understand like what the KPIs that each team plays and influencing that and moving that forward and what data they need to drive that and what decisions they need to make and how you define success. And I think a lot of times we don't define success clear enough in terms of like what our expectations are at a secondary metric level, right? We look at it as like, I want a million dollars in revenue. What are leading indicators to get us there? What are the things that we should look at and set goals around so that we know before the end of the quarter where we're going to be, right? And start having more of like the predictability of those so we can turn the levers, turn the dials, run the experiments and do the things that we can measure against that tell the story of how we get there and help write the story more than anything. Perfect. Moving on to the last question of this section, there are so many compliance issues when it comes to data usage. What are some of the ethical considerations that RevOps professionals should be aware of when they are working with customer data? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so working closely, you know, with your chief data privacy officer and like, you know, your privacy team to make sure you have clear understanding of, you know, the laws and the regulations around the data is first and foremost, right? You want to make sure that you are in compliance and adherence, you know, based on the necessary responsibility of processing, of managing, of storing customer data. The other thing um, on top of that is like, I think about, you know, empathy is always a good thing, right? So first step is like, make sure you're, you're legally complying um, and working. Obviously, we're not lawyers, right? We're we didn't go to law school to be RevOps professionals, so make sure you're using using the resources um, within your organization to really drive that strategy and drive that drive those requirements. And then I generally think through like human nature, right? How do I feel about my data? A good example is like, if this got blasted on Twitter, would you be proud of this? Like, would this be an issue? And so thinking through those types of things, I think helps kind of as that rule of thumb of, you know, did it, am I making the best choices for the business? Am I doing right? Um, but again, the first step is being in compliance, make sure you're following legal regulation. Um, that goes back to like the data authority, the data strategy, 
strategy, the data governance, and making sure like those components are part part of that in terms of like your DPO regulations. Thanks for sharing that. That kind of brings us to the end of the first section. So we'll move to the second section of the podcast now. Again, this is something that we do with all our guests, the rapid fire round. Where we ask our guests a series of questions with the intention of getting to know you better. Besides only revops. Yeah, my first question is, what's one book that you have loved in the recent past that you would recommend? Yeah, so um, Crucial Conversations is a book that I read quite a bit. Um, I generally read this probably at least twice a year and have for a really long time. And if you're not familiar with it, uh, I highly recommend audiobook version of it because there's so many different scenario casts. But it's really, you know, as you're having very important business conversations or even personal conversations, like how do you focus on the right outcome? How do you make sure that you're creating a safe environment and getting value out of conversations? And I think like as, you know, the world of COVID, as we went more more remote, um, deal is 100% remote. Being able to have those conversations virtually adds like a whole other level of complexity to things. So how do you make sure like you can have tough conversations, get the right outcomes and do it in a professional and a positive and a meaningful way? Great book for anyone who's even starting their career or have been in their career. Like I said, I'd listen to it probably more than I should, but it's always a really good refresher. So that is definitely one that I enjoy. Predictable Success is another one that I just recently finished up that just kind of talks through journey and the stages of evolution as you're growing a business and like what to expect and just is really good refresher. I think a lot of the stuff is intuitive, but until you hear somebody say it a few times and then it starts to like actually click and make sense so those are fun ones a personal book that i like is um tiny beautiful things lady who wrote wild it's just a good good soft read if anyone's like i don't want to read a business book that i can also recommend there yeah we we love all kinds of recommendations so always thank you for sharing three recommendations we are definitely going to check all of them out next question is what's what's your favorite part about working in ops Yeah, I'm going to say two. So I think um, one of my favorite parts is like the the problem solving, right? So like the fact that, you know, every, you know, every day, there's a new problem, there's something new to address, like there's, you know, even if you're the most stable, productive, best organization in the world, there's always room for improvement. And like, the ops gives you the power to like really look at the problem, diagnose the problem and like put a plan in place for improvement and deliver on that. I think the other part of my favorite part about operations, um, you know, as they've been building out teams and mentoring and growing is like really helping develop people as they either make career moves into revenue operations or are further growing their career in revenue operations because there's so much flexibility, right? It's not just that you come in and you're this like specialist of revenue ops, right? There's so many different ways you can specialize, things you can um, further expand in and have that diversification. So I've really enjoyed helping people grow in their career, mentor them, give them the opportunity to, you know, take like a Salesforce developer who sits under RevOps, right? If they sit under RevOps and not IT, they have this opportunity to learn the business more. They're getting the ability to work on different types of projects, right? They're not just getting these Jira tickets and execute and design the solution, right? They get to be a part of kind of the sausage making and like a part of part of that. And it, I think it starts to open up like other opportunities and learning and growing. And I just, that's probably one of my favorite things about this is like, I still, while we have roles and responsibilities, because of the fact that there's always so much to do, you get a lot of cross training and you get a lot of opportunity to kind of like shift and learn and like help out and grow in ways that you maybe wouldn't grow and necessarily in like a more standard type of function. Right. Love that. We've, we've spoken about the favorite parts. So if I'm going to the I know what's going to come next. To a more controversial part of it, like your least favorite part about working in ops. Yeah, I think one of my least favorite parts, and this is, you know, I I think a lot of people empathize with this, is that we are very, and I don't want to say reactive, right? There's always work to do. There's always problems to solve. Like there's always fire drills. And one of the things that I really have to focus on professionally and Um, I wish I had more time and space, right? So that if I can actually get out of the day to day and get out of like the executionary pieces and think through like the bigger initiatives and the bigger problems, right? Like it's, it's carving that time and space out to really do, do the bigger things. Um, And when I say bigger things, like that's, it's not to say the things that we do on a day to day aren't big, right? It's just getting that step up and taking that breath and being able to look and look and see. Right. And so when you sit in the day to day and you sit in the execution and you sit in like the working to get stuff done, you sometimes miss the forest through the trees. And so I think it's important that you can kind of take that step back. And so I'm really trying to be more purposeful about carving that time out every week to say, like, this is my like think time. I don't have, you know, a firm agenda. I don't have something like I'm really trying to do, but like I 
going to try to take a problem or something that I've seen that week and really like hone in on it and see how I can drive the business forward. So this whole debate about, you know, strategic versus tactical is something that I think a lot of our guests have highlighted, just like you did right now. Now, my next question in the rapid fire round is, who is one RevOps leader that you personally look up to and and why? Oh, I think there's tons, right? I look up to almost like anyone in like the Rev, you know, the Rev Genius community is great out there. There's so many good communities out there, you know, Roslyn and Jeff and there's tons, right? Like I look at Chili Piper's like top 32 that they ran earlier those this year. And I'm like, yeah, every one of those people are people that I look up to and I look to for advice, right? Like this isn't an organizational function that like we all come in and we've had these great, you know, I look at like AEs, right? You take a career path of an AE man, you've got these great sales leaders that you're working for. And every company you go to, you know, there's going to be a sales leader, right? Like for a lot of us, we're either first time in running revenue operations team, first time role in revenue operations. We're defining a lot as we go. We, we don't have peers, right? Like there's certainly not been a peer environment. So this community and this network has become our peers. And I think, you know, Jared with Rev Genius has done a great job of building out that community. Um, Syncery's built out a customer data community that really just only focuses on, you know, talking about customer data and best practices in there. So, um, you know, even two years ago, communities were just starting to be a thing. And so, you know, I, I don't know that there's one necessarily specific RevOps leader. I think I lean a lot on my network and I lean a lot on people just based on their specific experience too um, and what where I'm looking to grow and develop. Yeah, yeah. No, I completely agree with you. I think the RevOps community is, is of a special kind and uh, they are always looking out for each other and learning from each other. And it's, there's so much to learn from these communities. So many people to be inspired by every day. My next question is an advice that you've received from someone that has stayed with you uh, in your life, helped you, that you would like to share with us. Yeah. I think it's Mis Mr. Rogers um, is probably gave this advice, but like, just be kind, right? Like, and I think, you know, the thing that I think a lot about is like, clear is kind. And I think it's important, especially when we're in, in roles where we are asked to do a lot, there's a lot going on. Um, you know, it's, I think, you know, I'm a natural people pleaser. Like I love saying yes. I love, you know, making people happy. I love delivering good work, but like, you've got to not do that at the sacrifice of like your own well being and your own health and your family and like the those things. So being really clear and purposeful on like your prioritization, your capacity, your needs are really, really important. Um, the thing that I instruct my team on and I make them push and challenge me is like, I expect my team to be at capacity, right? I expect them to have a full day of work when they come in, you know, we have the work to do. On the flip side of that is that if I ask them to do something, I expect them to tell me what's not going to get done or make me make a trade off, right? And that's, that's the way that I want, I want leadership to realize and those things too, right? Like if you're running a best in class operations team, that's efficient and effective, like we're not sitting on our hands. So let's make trade-offs. Let's make sure we have aligned roadmaps. Let's be really clear. Um, the worst thing you can do is like start in a project that take is taking thought, taking development, taking work and shift a goalpost when you're almost there. Cause you either pause the project and then have to come back and pick it all up and start over. Or you potentially like are just going to waste time in making decisions and go through kind of just the fatigue cycle. So, you know, my, my big advice is like clear is kind, um, unclear is unkind. So I'd rather be the person who says no directly. So no is a full sentence. Um, and I remind myself of that a lot, but you know, no, I can't do that because of X, Y, and Z is, is clear versus yeah, let maybe, right. Let me, let me think about it. So like, make sure you're you're holding yourself accountable for your actions and your commitments to the business um, versus piling it on and burning yourself out because then you're not going to be as productive and not as meaningful and not as satisfied, right? The happier people they are at their job, the better their work is. Yeah, I love that. I think I'm also going to take that advice and apply it to my own uh, work life as well. Thank you for that. Last question that I have for you is, you know, RevOps is coming up as a very popular job role and head of RevOps was one of the most sought after roles. You must have seen that report from LinkedIn as well. So there are a lot of young newcomers who, who are probably wanting to join the field. So as someone who's been in the space for so long, what advice would you give them as they begin their journey or someone who would have your job someday? Yeah, absolutely. It's not as glamorous as everyone thinks, right? Like I think, 
you know, it's, it's the sexy job, right? But it, it's hard work and it requires a lot of work. It's a lot to understand, a lot to know, and not a lot to coordinate. Um, you know, you're not just working in a single function. You're generally working across, across the organization and not only doing tactical tooling execution, but also high level strategy. So there's, there's a lot of components that go into this, this work and, um, this. And I think, you know, part of the thing that I would encourage people to do who are like, I really want to grow my career in RevOps is like, learn, right? Like find good mentors, start to learn, start to ask the questions, like um, be really humble in what you're doing. Um, Operations and getting operations experience takes time. You know, you're not going to go to like one company and have it all figured out because operations is a management of process and business processes are all different. So be okay taking the step back and looking at the organization and the efficiency. Like you're almost, you know, it's important to be an expert in the organization and expert in the process. But it's also important to like not be so ingrained in it that you can't see its flaws. And that's something that I try to remember a lot in RevOps is like, am I am I too vested in this? Am I too close to this that I can't see what's not working because I've been just sitting in it for so long, right? So how do you take take that and like really make sure you keep that consultant or that external lens to make sure you're always looking for improvement and looking for areas to grow and adjustments? So um, the other thing like I would say in terms of like, I want to get into RevOps, if that's your point or your passion, again, join the communities, get start to identify mentors, ask questions, understand, you know, why, why do you want to get into RevOps, right? I think that's a big, big piece, you know, is it that you're passionate about improving business outcomes? Is that you want to help support kind of, you know, sales? Is it a financial component from an analytics standpoint? Like what, what's the facet that like drives you? Because I think that'll help, you know, narrow down kind of like the focus and the different types of opportunities you go into um, as you grow. And it's not to say you can't start in tech and tools and move into sales operations or, you know, cross functions, but be really purposeful about the type of function that you're trying to get into and the why you're trying to get into it. Um, I joke when people are like, oh yeah, I want to move into RevOps for the money. Yeah. I mean, don't, that's probably not, not the right, the right reason um, for it, but you know, like really think about, think about that. And the other thing is like, think about your career experience, right? Like by understanding this, like, where does this, where does this take you? Right? Like what, what are the career opportunities that you're looking for um, as you grow as well? So like any role that you take should be your next step to get to your next role. Right. Um, And so thinking, thinking about that and making sure you're making those investments in your career and yourself are also super important. Yeah, that's some brilliant advice for anybody who's uh, looking to, you know, get into the space or evolve or grow in the space. So thank you, Molly. Thank you so much for sharing all those nuggets of wisdom with us. It has been a great episode and I think we got some brilliant insights. Thank you so much. You have a great day ahead of you. Perfect. Well, really appreciate it. And thanks, thanks for having me today.